Thank you. Uh, Deputy Donnelly. Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, thank you all for, for, um, for coming in. I'm just going to run through some questions and then maybe you can, you can take them um, whoever you see fit. Um, on, um, my first question was who does the equality budgeting? And um, I take your point that the departments need to do it in the first instance because actually it needs to be part of the, the, the policy development process right from the start. And actually it needs to seep into the mindsets as well. Um, I remember I did a piece of policy work in the UK and someone at, at the end of it um, said, have you gender proofed it? And I'd ne I had never heard of gender proofing and thought about the, the work I had been doing for the last year. I said, oh, actually, do you know what? No. And it, it, not only do you do the analysis, but it actually changes how you think fundamentally. So I absolutely understand that. However, um, I think there is a role, uh, a, a, a QC role, a quality control role, similar to the um, relationship IFAC has with finance and deeper. Um, because even with the best will in the world, the civil servants may come under political pressure. Um, you may have a culture that doesn't necessarily seek the absolute truth. Um, certainly that would be the case within some of the departments. Um, the the kind of very basic distributive analysis, dis distribution analysis we get on budget day is politicized. It basically is best case scenarios where I coming up with um, how this affects Linda and her two sons versus the, the, the ones that come out on budget day. It hides all the bad news and uh, puts, you know, highlights all the, all the good news. So the only, the only kind of vague equality proofing we get is it's, it's a political document. There's nothing uh, independent about it. And therefore, uh, somebody needs to be in a QC role. Um, and I think it would be very useful to report to the budgetary committee as to whether or not, as to their view on the analysis, in exactly the same way as IFAC does for uh, Deeper in Finance, because there were questions as to the um, lack of political interference or, you know, attempts at political interference. So I just think it's something to consider. The only two groups that I'm aware of that could do that are yourselves, uh, potentially the ESRI. They could, they don't have the capacity right now, but they could, they could, they could hire it in. I think certainly from an analytical perspective, they could, they could, um, they could do it. So I just would like your thoughts on that. And um, secondly, in terms of scope, I know you're saying you're bringing together a, a bunch of experts on Friday, which is great to hear. And if you could send us a copy of your findings, that'd be, that'd be great. Do you have standard equality budgeting framework? There's nine dimensions. Some of them are more important than others. Um, you know, do you have a view? There's, then there's poverty proofing, which is slightly different to equality budgeting. It requires a different analytical approach. And then the whole rights-based approach requires a whole different uh, quantitative and qualitative approach again. So it's a, it's a big piece of analytical work, both qual and quant. Do you have a view right now as to actually for this budgetary cycle, if the, the, the Oireachtas was to pick three, five, you know, there's the standard distributional one. Is it gender? Is it geography? Is it age? Is it race? Is it disability? You know, what are, what are the ones that the Oireachtas really needs to get its, get its head around very quickly? Um, in terms of timing, I noticed in your report you, you state that it's, it's an ongoing process uh, with the budget. But for the, this is a committee looking at the arrangements for the full committee that comes into force. When do you think the permanent committee should be getting substantive equality human rights proofing analysis from the departments with you know input from yourselves at what what point in the year like what month really does the do, does the committee really need to be getting its head around uh, those issues there's obviously a bit of a chicken and egg situation which is budgetary measures don't get announced until, until budget day but if you want to do ex ante analysis you kind of need to know the measures ahead of time so it's it's, it, it's a difficult one, obviously. Um, can I ask, in terms of it, it, the standing committee is going to have to, presumably, chair, someone is going to have to come up with a detailed spec on equality proofing, poverty proofing, whatever, whatever the catch-all phrase is for this. Um, there's a detailed spec is going to have to be put together with exactly the kind of analysis that the sectoral committees and the budget oversight committee are going to need do you have a view, maybe it's you, but do you have a view as to who should do that and, and how quickly 
the Standing Committee could get that. Um, can I ask, in terms of the civil service at the moment, I was surprised to hear you say, Mary, that you thought the expertise already existed. I mean, Article 42, or Section 42 in the 2014 Act, that's a, that's a big piece of legislation. That's potentially a game changer. I would be very surprised and very happy here. I'd be very surprised if the departments have that capacity, because it's a new thing they're being asked to do. It's really a very specialised skill set. So can I just ask, I, I was very surprised to hear you saying there's no criticism of the departments. It's a new piece of work. They've never had to do it before. How is it that you think they have, in this, especially in the middle of a hiring embargo, how is it that they have this very specialised skill set already in-house? Um, also in terms of your role, j just a thought, if, if, final thought, uh, sorry, one question. How many analysts are you going to have to do the analysis? I know you're not going to do the proofing yourselves, but even to be the people who come to the standing committee to give an expert opinion on the equality proofing that's come out of the departments, actually, what size is your analytical team going to be? Is it going to be Lawrence plus two? Is it going to be Lawrence? Is it going to be Lawrence plus 20? Can you give us a sense for what you've been sanctioned to hire up? Like, how much firepower are you actually going to have? And can you hire serious people? Like, are you kind of hiring 22-year-olds with a master's degree? Or actually, are you hiring serious analysts who have, you know, PhDs in econometrics? Um, finally, just a thought. Yeah. It's a, it, this is a technical area, and it's not one that the Oireachtas knows its way around terribly well. Um, and Chair, maybe a thought for our, for our report is there's probably a very useful piece of training to be done. And actually, there's an initial piece of training. There's probably an annual. It's one thing the Oireachtas does nothing on is continuous professional development. This is really technical stuff, and it's really important stuff. So even one-off training, or ideally refresher courses every year, or at the start of a dull term for everyone on the committee just might be something. It seems that this group might be the right people to run that kind of training. Thank you. A good suggestion, actually, didn't make just your questions. Trying to figure out how many, <laughs> many questions you've asked. There's about six there. Um, your first one was about who does the equality budgeting. You mentioned independence, institutional independence, and I, I suppose I would uh, agree with that. I think that that autonomy does give you freedom to comment in a different way. We see ourselves having a different, occupying a different space than civil society or or NGOs. Um, and you mentioned the ESRI. I'm sounding reluctant to answer that question. It's largely because area one of 15 and if I commit to certain things today um, but I suppose in in terms of our institutional independence I suppose we would be open-minded would we Mary would that be would that be fair to say I'm, I'm trying to look at our staff because it's easy for me to say yes to these things without um, committing but more to more to the kind of fundamental issue of the independent nature of that commentary rather than um, what you described as a very obviously politicized uh, commentary in terms of the five, probably Mary is best. When we went to the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, we did refer to gender equality, we, we referred to disability, we referred to minority groups, uh, Roma and traveller groups. So we did we, we refer to specific groups, um, I suppose, that have the potential to be disproportionately affected by any budget. But they may be um, at, at the margins, but any uh, policy decision may disproportionately affect them or push them further into the margins. So they, they were some of the groups that I thought of. Mary, would you add, you mentioned if we were to pick five, what we might pick? Yeah, um, just in terms of keeping the thought process at the beginning, I suppose in relation to the potential IREC quality control role, um, I, like, there is that thing that uh, IREC could be the one that holds the system to account in terms of commenting on the overall quality. Um, and I think we would need to talk, talk that out, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. tactically and strategically. Um, there's also IREC as the enabler of, of civil society to do that. Um, and that might be more around the training, the, for example, training journalists to properly be able to engage in, in, in commenting on the quality of proofing, maybe as important as IREC themselves doing it. Um, so I don't, I don't want to kick to touch on it, but... Respected. <laughs> But, but, but I, do, I do think that... Yeah. <laughs> One of your 22-year-old graduates that you referred to earlier. <laughs> 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 Go on, you're dying. <laughs>
<laughs> like a lot of the evaluations of all of these types of proofing mechanisms, they ultimately end in asking, like, did it generate change? You know, did it actually change the policy that you were going to do? And I, it's very, very hard to get the evidence because, because inside civil servants departments won't say, well, yeah, I changed that after I proofed it. But nonetheless, it seems more that the power of the proofing mechanisms is what what it does to the overall capacity of society to hold the, the democratic system to account about the distribution of resources. And that, that's about using the more transparent and accountability mechanisms and bringing more alive the, the capacity of society to, to hold governments to account about the distribution of resources. And there are very many ways IREC can, can engage in doing that. One of them is coming into an expert committee and saying this is good enough quality or not. It may not be the best way for us to do that. Um, and choosing to do that may distract from or deter us from other potential roles that might actually be more fruitful. So I do think it's, it's worth thinking about that. But, can, but, can I just ask you then, I mean, you're, you're setting up the organisation. My view is, is somebody, there is great value to the budgetary process and the policy development process for somebody to be providing a QC, an expert QC role, just like IFAC does. IFAC's role, they're, they're, they're feeling their way into their role, but it's a very useful piece. Some departments are excellent um, and have the expertise and the culture to really drive that. Some of them are brutal. They have neither the expertise nor the inclination to do the work, that, you, you know, the kind of equality budgeting work. Um, so without an IFAC equivalent, and you are a statutory body, which matters as opposed to being an NGO, right? It gives you weight that an NGO just will not have. Um, without that, the standing committee, and indeed the sectoral committees, really will be beholden to each individual department to give them expert, independent analysis that may end up making the line minister look really bad. So there is, a, there is a valuable role for someone. So can I ask you to just think about that role in your deliberations as you, as you yeah, no, grow into the space? I certainly would think about it. Um, and I suppose w what the trade-off would be then, does, does that deter from the capacity to, to play enabling roles, to win the trust of departments, to have the conversations you'd need to have to get departments to take risks with trying out certain mechanisms? And there are trade-offs there. My sense is it's not an either-or. Um, and that it, where, where IBEC to have some sort of quality control role, it would be IBEC with others in, in for example, something like that eBag process that I talked about or something. It, it would be a, a coming together uh, of assessments and, and some process like, like IFAC to make that role, but it needn't be only IREC, but I certainly see that we would be an, an actor in it. Um, you, you asked so many questions there that are there. Lost the thing. Just the other one on training, because I thought it was worth mentioning. I mentioned media training myself there. I, I would see very much that would be part of IREC's role, that we would be able to provide expert training. And for example, we already have an institutional relationship with the Institute of Public Administration, where we already run certificates in human rights and equality. It would be very feasible to see us running specialised diploma level you know, programs in proofing, and that that would be a way of signalling again to, to people, you need to do this to get on. Um, in the service, yeah. One of the other questions then was your view that the departments already have sufficient capacity to implement uh, Section 42 and yeah. to do and to do the, this new work. Okay. Like this is, this I, is big new work. Okay. Well, I said that they had significant capacity. I, I, as, as we've already established, there are a very different range of, of proofing mechanisms. Some, some rest at the level of the distribution analysis of, of key policy uh, proposals. And we know that departments do that already. In, in, and we know that they use switch. And we know that that advice is, goes to the tax strategy group, etc. So some of those skills are available. But the types of skills, as you say, that are more related to Section 4, which is how do you use policy to advance equality is less part of our culture. So we're good, we have some track record maybe at defensive proofing, if you like, um, but, the, but the more creative use of proofing, which is how do you use it to really progressively realise rights, to advance equality, to achieve outcomes, I don't think we tend to be very 
rich in that, in that type of skill set. I, I would take you there. What I was more referring to is that there is a track record that some departments engage in distribution analysis of their, and, and they don't make it accountable or, or transparent, but they do do it, um, maybe more than, than it might look to, to the broad public policy process. I think my final question was um, each size. I think they answered the training, training question. Yeah, like, kind of what's your analytical, be it qualitative or quantitative capacity, how many people are you going to have who can actually look at the departmental analysis and come into this committee and say education are spot on, deeper are spot on, actually we think the social welfare analysis is wrong because it hasn't included cuts to public services, for example. Ooh, how do we answer that one? <laughs> I, I suppose we answer it in the sense of, yeah, we're growing um, IREC and we have capacity to grow, yeah, and it would depend on where this took mm. precedent over other priority areas of work that we could do. And to some degree that would depend on how our, our role emerged as these institutional spaces emerge and, and what kind of space and roles that we found us. I mean, we've talked about very different types of potential roles that IRIC can play, encouraging roles, enabling roles, compliance roles, quality control roles. We're not probably going to do all of those things, so to some degree it would very much depend on what roles we did adopt and then to what degree we can deliver some of those roles by, by bringing in capacity, buying it in, um, as you say the SRI would have to do right now, or to what degree we grow in-house capacity. It would, it would obviously be a mixture of the two. One of the reasons that we very quickly got together the range of independent actors and experts from the, that are available to us easily from the English speaking world right now is that we see in the short instance that we would be buying in very specific expertises and capacities in the short term mm -hmm. and that you know, we, we wouldn't in place the arrangements to try and make sure that that's a very fluid um, thing that we can call in very, very easily. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Barris, do you have a brief question? Uh, yeah. uh, do I have to be that brief? No, <laughs> no I just, uh, I, I'm not speaking for the sake of speaking, but